We were at camp meeting the last couple Sabbaths, and some of the rest of you were there. Most of you were still here. Uh, they had a book for sale in the evening meeting most nights for one dollar. The book of the night. Now, if you think carefully and check, you'll realize they've had these books in the back warehouse for quite a while and they haven't been able to sell them. <laughs> That's why they're one dollar. So you're taking a bit of a chance when you buy the one dollar book and one of the nights we were there, I wasn't sure I really wanted to buy the book or not. What Jesus really meant, it's by a Greek teacher. Greek to me, Greek to you. I decided, well, it's only a dollar. I'll see if it was worth the dollar. I'm going to share some of the stuff out of this book with you this morning, and you get to see if you think it was worth a dollar or not. One of the first things he talks about is the language Jesus spoke. Now, I thought I knew the language Jesus spoke. Turns out, I guess I didn't. Uh, I always heard it was Aramaic. When the Israelites went to Babylon to captivity, they learned the language, and as it says about Daniel, the language and learning of the Chaldeans. Well, it turns out the Chaldean language is a dialect of Aramaic. And the Israelites came back from Babylon speaking Aramaic, writing Aramaic, and they continued using Aramaic uh, after they came back from Babylon. Several hundred years later, when Jesus comes along, my understanding, that's what I was always taught, was he spoke Aramaic, the disciples spoke Aramaic, everybody in Palestine spoke Aramaic. How many of you have heard that? A few of you have heard that. Mr. Litke says, no. I mean, they did speak Aramaic in their homes. But when we look at all of the documents we have from the era, and we have lots of documents, scraps of this and pages of that, it, it could be a, a list of things that you just bought or a letter from kids to their parents, lots and lots and lots of documents. And in 1 and 200 BC, the first and second centuries BC, most of the documents in Palestine are in Aramaic. But in the first century AD, when Jesus was here, they're almost all in Greek. They're in Greek. Who knew? I didn't know. It turns out they're still speaking Aramaic in the home, but out in public, even between Israelites, they're using Greek all the time. Every day they all spoke. Peter spoke Greek. <laughs> he, he didn't have to get a translator when he wrote. I always heard that great portions of the New Testament were written in Aramaic. We never found any of it written in Aramaic. But we said that because we thought that they all spoke Aramaic, so they would have had to written in their natural language. That's what they spoke it in, right? No. In public, they all spoke Greek. Uh, after the Babylonian captivity, uh, the Persians were the next empire, but the Persians picked up Aramaic and they used it as well. Uh, so it wasn't just the, the Israelites that used it. But when Alexander the Great came along and conquered the whole uh, realm, he was Greek and spoke Greek and Greek spread around the empire. Uh, it hadn't taken over in, in public discourse in Palestine until around the time of Jesus, but then it did. And, and there are several bits of evidence that, that uh, Mr. Litke presents to, to demonstrate that they presumably did use Greek in their public discourse. First of all, the documents, which I told you about. Secondly, there are, there are sayings in the New Testament that don't make sense unless the original was spoken in Greek. 
because it uses nuances of Greek that don't exist in Aramaic. And if you said it in Aramaic, you wouldn't say it that way. <laughs> but it, it plays the, the, the details of Greek in some of the things that Jesus said. He spoke Greek. He probably spoke Greek most of the time. Most of what we have in the red letters from Jesus would have been originally spoken in Greek. Did you know that? I did not know that. But it puts a new and interesting light on some of the things that he says. Because it's not the writer later putting it into Greek, choosing those words. That was Jesus himself choosing that word to say that thing that way in Greek. It's like, oh, it means more now. Suddenly, it's not a translation with, did he really say it that way? Or, no, no, no. He said it that way. And there are places where Jesus did speak Aramaic. And it records it in Aramaic with the Greek translation. So that when he actually used Aramaic, it was unusual. And it got special treatment. And it was then translated at the raising of, of uh, Jairus' daughter. Mark chapter 5, verse 41. Mark chapter 5, verse 41. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha, kumi, which is translated... Little girl, I say to you, arise. The translation is Greek. The Taluthi Kumi is Aramaic. So he said to her in Aramaic, Missy, get up. And they translated that into Greek because the, the gospel is written in Greek. But most of what he said, most of the time, was presumably in Greek. New thought to me. And, and, it, and it changes the dynamic of how to understand what was happening. On the cross, Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verse 34. Mark 15, 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, Eli, God, El, El, E, the E on the ending makes it possessive mind, my God, my God, my God, which is translated, <laughs> my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the Greek translation of the Aramaic, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani. He said it in Aramaic. The language he used in home as a kid with mommy and daddy. That's what he reverts to at that moment on the cross. It was the exception rather than the rule for him to speak in Aramaic. Even the Romans in Jesus' day generally spoke Greek, although Latin was the official language of government business. But they also mostly spoke Greek. The whole realm in Jesus' day mostly spoke Greek most of the time. Which is why we have the New Testament in Greek. Because it was the language everybody used. Uh, the nearest thing we have now is English worldwide is widely spoken. But I think it was even maybe a bit more common even than English because the other countries picked it up for their own use in their own culture most of the time, not just international communication, but their own use. And so, we have the words for love in the New Testament. There were three Greek words for love. Eros, philos, agape. Eros, sexual love, and it's a word that never occurs in the New Testament. So, we don't have to worry about that for New Testament usages. It just doesn't happen. Philos, brotherly love, affection for someone, you like someone, 
you're fond of them. Uh, it's a root that is also found in, in the name of Philadelphia. Phila, the philos part of Philadelphia is brotherly love. City of brotherly love is how that translates out. And agape. Agape was an old word that wasn't used very much. And I always heard that it was picked up by the writers of the New Testament to explain to us what God's love that Jesus has taught us about, what it's really like. We need this new word. And so they packed new meanings into the old word. And it kind of takes on a new life that it didn't have before. And a new set of breadth of meaning that it didn't have before, given to it by its usage in the New Testament. I always understood that came from the writers of the New Testament. But if Jesus was speaking in Greek, he picked that word. He picked that word. And he packed that word with all these meanings that we thought the writers put on there. No, he was building the word for the meaning he wanted us to learn from it. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's the what? He's the word. He's the communicator for the Godhead. We shouldn't be too shocked if he picked the word and he packed the meaning into it. So Jesus is the one who gave us the word agape. Well, what is agape love? Litke points out that it means to value someone or something very highly. God has agape toward us. Does he value us? Oh yeah. And it shows in his agape love to us, his selfless love to us. Agape has other qualities too. One of the qualities of agape is that it does not require any positive response from the recipient to keep giving it to them. Now, when I was in college, one of my first classes, first semester, I think that was when it was, was a survey of music class. Oh, Janelle had been in survey of music class, yeah. I can't remember the lady's name, but you had her too. <laughs> And, and so I was sitting in the back of survey of music class and there's a cute girl sitting on the front row. Got my eye on her. <laughs> now there were other girls there too. There were some of those other girls had their eye on me. I wasn't. In our, in our romantic love relationships, we are usually looking for someone for whom we have positive feelings and they in return have positive feelings for us, right? That's what makes that work. But God's love, he gives to us even if we never give anything positive back. That's one of the characteristics of agape love. It doesn't have to have a positive response to keep coming. And God says, if I've loved you that way, you need to love each other that way too. It helps. It helps a lot. Even in our romantic relationships, there are probably moments when we're not feeling like giving or like we're getting back the positive we're looking for. Agape. Think agape. <laughs> Love them anyway. God does it to us. And we can do it for them. So, 
Agape was used to explain love in a new way. Jesus used it to help us understand how God loves us and what our love should become by his grace. John 13, 34. John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you agape one another, as I have agaped you, that you also agape one another. I'm telling you that my kind of love, God's kind of love, which I'm showing to you is what you need to learn to show to each other, but this was not put in by the writer, John. This was put in by Jesus himself talking to people. He used these words. He put that meaning in. So when he says, a new commandment I give you, the new part of the commandment is the meaning of love as clarified by the word agape. That's what's new. That's what's new. And that wasn't added by the writer of the gospel. That was put in by Jesus himself. The word gave us this word to show what God's love is like. John 21. After Jesus' resurrection, they're on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. They've been fishing all night. They caught nothing. And Jesus says from the shore, them not knowing who it was, he says, children, have you any food? And in, in other words, hey, did you catch anything? Nah, this fisherman, you know, how, how's the fishing? Terrible, been up all night, caught nothing. He says, cast the net on the right side of the boat, you'll find some. Now, why they didn't know at that moment it was Jesus, he did that once for them before, remember? <laughs> but right at that moment, whoosh, right past him, they still don't catch that it's him. Uh, and then finally they get it. Uh, John says, it's Jesus. Peter, who didn't recognize him as Jesus, uh, jumps into the sea, swims to shore. They drag the fish in. And there on the shore, Jesus already has some fish cooked ready for breakfast. He says, bring some of yours. He puts them on the fire too. They have breakfast and afterward, Jesus is walking on the shore with Peter. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Meaning more than these other disciples. Remember just before Jesus, I mean, just before Peter denied knowing Jesus, that night he said, I'll never deny you. I'll never let you down. I will die for you. Now he was one of the two disciples that had a sword. And when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden with that whole mob against them, Peter pulled his sword out and engaged in battle. He was serious when he said, I will die for you. But when Jesus said, that's not how we do it. Put the sword back. Peter hadn't a clue what to do. Run, I guess, like all the rest. He really intended and made good in a certain human sense, not God's way, but in, in his own way. He pulled the sword out and took off the ear of the high priest's servant. At which point Jesus had already had his hands bound, and I love the little description that Ellen White has of it. He says to the people who have him bound, allow me this much and he releases his hand heals the ear 
and puts his hand back for them to tie him up again. Now, I don't know what's going through the mind of those guys when they tie him up again, but they should be thinking seriously about what you're doing right now. You just watched him slide his hand right out. You tied a good knot, you know you did. You know you're knots. Now, some of us just throw knots together, but some of us know knots. And those guys knew their knots. And they knew you can't do that. But he just did. You just watched him do it. Healed the ear and proceed. Peter had meant to be loyal. When he got into the courtyard, the gal at the gate said, you're not one of them, are you? Only in the Greek. It's built in such a way that it automatically assumes the way the question is asked that the answer is no. You're not one of them, are you? And he, without much thinking, said, no. Nah. No. Nah. And that's all there was to it. And the next time he's asked the question, it's also built with the no as the expected answer. No, you're not one of them, are you? No. Nah. Again, not much thought, just popped it off. But the third time, Somebody pins their eye on him and says, I saw you in the garden with him, didn't I? It's a relative of the man whose ear got chopped off. He would know. He would know. He saw Peter swing the sword, take his cousin's ear off. He knows. I saw you there. I saw you there. And all of a sudden, it isn't a question with an automatic no expected answer. And if you say nothing, that's what they'll assume. All of a sudden, he is pinned with an eyewitness who says, not only are you one of his disciples, you were in the garden and you took an ear off. We might have a score to settle with you. And all of a sudden, Peter was in a very different spot, and the devil had him cornered, and he didn't know what to do. So, he cursed and swore. And some people say, you know how sailors are. But in the Bible, when you swore, you could be swearing to the truthfulness of what you're saying. I swear. I don't know him. And the curses could be, may God strike me down if it's not so. You call God's curses on you if you're not true and you swear that you are telling the truth. It wasn't bad language. It wasn't that kind of cursing and swearing. It was an oath that what I'm saying is true. But then they say, yeah, but you're a Galilean and your speech gives you away. That one got flipped on his head for me, too. It turns out, I used to think that the Galileans were crude and, and rough and tumble fishermen. No, actually, the Galileans were the ones who were known for their careful use of the language. It's the people down in Jerusalem who were known as the rough and rowdy rabble, the way they talked. <laughs> You're clean, careful, exact speech tells me you're a Galilean, they say. Who knew? Who knew? It was opposite of what I always thought. Uh, yeah. So now, on the seashore, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me more than these? Thought I heard you claiming that the night you denied me. <laughs> you still hold to that? And Peter's answer is, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. 
I love you with brotherly love. He's not claiming agape. So Jesus asks him again. Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? And again, he says, yes, Lord, you know that I... No, do you agape me? Sorry, Jesus asked, do you agape me a second time? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Tend my sheep, he says. Third time, Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? Jesus is using the Greek and Peter knows the Greek. And when Jesus flipped from agape, do you agape me to do you phileo me? He was really saying, do you really even have me as a friend? Do friends do what you did? Do you really even love me as a friend? That stung. That stung. And Peter said, Yes, Lord, you know all things, you know, I phileo you. The play of agape and phileo in that setting doesn't make sense if they weren't talking Greek. But if they're talking Greek, it makes perfect sense. He's asking, do you love me? With God's kind of love, and Peter won't claim that. He's come down from his high opinion of himself. His, his balloon has deflated. And he won't claim it. Twice. But that third time when Jesus switches to phileo. Mm, 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 that hurt. But he did say, you know everything. You know I phileo you. John 3, 16. Familiar verse. We read it for our scripture reading this morning. <laughs> Turns out there's things in there I didn't know either. <laughs> That's a pretty familiar verse, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. Now, if you take that in the, in the light of agape, God's kind of love, it says, God gave us his son because he considers the rebel children of Adam to be of such great value, agape. He loves us with agape love. He considers us to be of such great value that it is worth his son's crucifixion. That's how much we are worth to him. That's what agape says in that verse. And that is powerful. But there's another element in there that we don't see in English. The word so, God so loved the world. In the English translation, that sounds an awful like, a lot like, God loved us so much that he gave his son, right? That's what it sounds like. Not quite what the Greek's trying to say. Here, we are going to hit some words that not many of us know. <laughs> it turns out that almost every English translation treats the so in the way that King James does. I looked through a huge list of English translations of John 3.16 and Bible Gateway the other day. And almost all of them go with the, the sense that the King James has. But it's not quite what the Greek is saying. The word so in English comes from the Greek word hutos. Now hutos is an anaphoric, deictic adverb. Y'all know that, right? How many of you know what that just meant? Anybody know what an anaphoric is? 
Anybody know what a dictic is? Anybody know what an adverb is? Yes, okay, some of us know what an adverb is. I kind of recognize that one part, right? The other, I don't think I've ever heard the words before, but here's what it means. Adverb, of course, modifies a verb. Hey, got that. Dictic means it is pointing to something. It's pointing to something. So it is saying, in this way, the way God loves, not how much he loves. That's how the English sounds. It's the way he loves. Okay? It's pointing to that. And anaphoric means it's pointing back, not forward. The so, as used in English, God loved us so much he sent his son. That's pointing forward to he sends his son. But in the Greek, the anaphoric means it's pointing back. He loved us in the way we just talked about. Oh. Oh, well, what's that? Well, that's why verse 14 and 15 were in the scripture reading this morning. <laughs> because that's where it talks about the way. Okay, so let's read verse 14 and 15. What's that? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The serpent in the wilderness, the, the, the snake, snake's a symbol in scripture of the devil, evil, Satan, except right here, it's a symbol of Jesus. I chewed all around the edges on that for a long time before I was comfortable with that. That's weird, frankly, that's weird. But I have learned, when you find something in scripture that's weird, it's like a little sign poked in the lawn right by the bump that says, dig here, dig here. Because there's a reason why it's weird. And when you dig there and find out the reason why it's not the way we expected, you're gonna learn something you didn't know before. And it's often cool stuff buried right there under that bump in the lawn. So, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Jesus is going to be lifted up in the same way. Well, part of that lifting up of Jesus is on the cross, his death on the cross. But the scripture also says he was Isaiah 53, he was numbered with the transgressors. He was numbered with the transgressors? Eh. Is he a transgressor? No, no. So how do you get numbered with the transgressors? You become one when you're not. And you get counted as one and treated as one and experience what they experience and die the death that belongs to them. And that's the second death from which you don't come back. Anyone lifted on a tree is accursed, never gonna be in God's kingdom. All of that is built into the symbol of the snake on the pole, telling us that Jesus took the sinner's death on himself for us, he took it from us, and he took it for us. He took our place in the second death. So we don't have to die that death. That's pretty deep love for us, that he would be willing to give his entire self and his future existence for us to have life. That's serious love, serious love. Bible says, Well, maybe it doesn't say it that way, but it, it teaches that we cannot fall below God's love. We cannot fall below where Jesus has already gone to for us because he loves us. Amen. The second death that belongs to the devil and his angels, he took that. That's the lowest spot in the universe is where the devil's going to end up. Spiritually, that's the low spot of the universe. 
Jesus had been there already for us. And that's what that symbol means. So in John 3, 16, it's looking back to the serpent on the pole as the way God loves us. In that way, God loved us when he sent his son to be crucified. That's the father himself loving us that way with that agape love that will give everything it has so that we can have life. Even his own life. Turns out, not just for a weekend, he was willing to give it forever. He did come back. But when he died, it was like he wouldn't come back. And he did it anyway. He did it anyway. So the anaphoric deictic adverb is saying God so loved the world. In this way, God loved the world. The way that the lifting up on a pole as a serpent demonstrates. That's the way God loves us when he sends his son. That's built into the so of John 3, 16. I didn't know that. I had no clue that that was in there. I've, I've met those ideas before, but not in that word. Did not know that in that most familiar of all verses, it had that packed right in there in the word so. That's quite a lot to pack into one word, isn't it? It turns out that there's one word does it in Greek, and you can't do it with one word in English. <laughs> we have to string a phrase together to make it work in English. So, uh, it comes out something like this. It was in this way, by giving his son to be raised on a cross like the serpent on the pole, that God loved the world. His love compelled him to send his son to be crucified, to be raised on a cross, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's all right there in John 3, 16. Who knew? Who knew? Time's up. Uh, can I give you one more? It's okay? Okay. The unjust judge, Luke chapter 18. Beginning in verse 1, he spoke a parable to them that men ought, always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Not a great translation at the end there. Lest by her continual coming she weary me. Uh, <laughs> so, the, the widow has been persistently coming and the judge has been persistently ignoring her request. And it has become a battle of wills. Who will cave first? Is she going to quit coming because he's never going to do it? Or is he going to break down and do it because she'll never quit coming? And that's kind of where we are when he has this conversation in his own head that says, I guess I'll give her what she's asking for. I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. Well, it really could be more like well, in Greek. Okay, in the middle of that sentence, uh, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Somewhere in the middle of that sentence, there's a little word thrown in that doesn't get translated into English because it doesn't exactly represent a word. It represents an idea. The idea that the answer uh, is a no. And, and Well, sorry, that comes later. My, my, my bad, my bad. Right here, uh, her continual coming ends with her hupo piazo me. 
she will hoopo piazzo. What's hoopo? Well, hoopo is related to hippopotamus and the hypodermic needle, it's under, okay? And it comes from prize fighting and it means she's going to punch me under the eye. She's gonna give me a black eye. She may get mad enough to smack me in the face. I guess she's getting pretty irritated with him and he can see it. And he's a little bit scared that she might actually just punch him. That's what it says. She may punch me. She may punch me. So short of that, before she gets to that, I'm going to give her what she's asking for. Now, that's the only reason he decided to give her. He was afraid to get punched. Our Heavenly Father is not reluctant to answer our petitions and requests. He cares about us. He loves us. He wants us to have good things. And so we're not fighting an uphill battle to get him on our side. We're not trying to get him to do what he doesn't want to do. Uh, he's on our side. But then the, the parable continues. Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? And this is where the extra little word comes in that doesn't get translated. It was my bad. It's ara, and it means the answer is no. Will he find faith on the earth? And the answer is no. No. So this parable is really saying, although God is vastly different from the unjust judge, and he's always on our side and always wants to do good things and always hears us and always responds, when Jesus comes back, will there be faith on the earth? And you could translate that, he will not find faith on the earth, will he? No, he won't. There will be some exceptions. But the general rule is no. No. How can that be with a God who loves us, responds to us, does good things for us, provides all we need, salvation, life? It all comes from him. How can it be that there won't be faith? And my prayer is that won't be true for us. But Jesus said that's true for the world. It's true for the world. There won't be faith. So, in picking the words to describe God's love, it's Jesus himself, the great word, who chose the word agape to pack with a new meaning of love. And in John 3, 16, God so loved the world, it's back to the snake on a pole that describes the way God loves us when he sends Jesus to die. And in spite of God being responsive to our petitions, when Jesus returns, faith on this earth will be a very rare thing. Hang on to it. Lord, I thank you for the richness that you have packed into your word and for a couple of glimpses of that today. Thank you. May we let your love grow in our hearts. May our hearts be open with faith to you. In Jesus' name, amen.